My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. The other evening, prior to our first session on Anglicanism, a group of us got into a conversation about love and God. Our conversation was sparked by an observance that some people of faith, some Christians, will say that they love God, but then condemn certain people for one reason or another. All of us felt an unease with such a position. How could one say they love God, but then hate or reject persons created and loved by God? It strikes many as rightly hypocritical for people of faith to reject those loved by God. Sadly, this hypocrisy has led countless people to reject the Christian way of life. It might be the very reason why the Christian church has been in decline for such a long period of time. Yet what is the remedy to our seemingly human way of accepting some while rejecting others? I've been thinking a lot about this over the past few days, particularly as I make my walks from home to church and back again, or on my journeys to my various appointments and meetings. Walking has always been a good spiritual exercise for me. It allows me to get away from my regular routine and take pause to notice the smaller details of life particularly this time of the year, where everything seems to be in its fullest glory, the plants, trees, and the hundreds of little creatures buzzing around. As I walked, it dawned upon me that maybe the answer was to be found in my walks. The simple exercise forced me to notice the small, fine details of the world around me. All too often, I am so busy with my own business that I fail to notice the beauty around me or even the needs of others. When I do, I become very self-focused, worried about my own concerns or challenges. Well, this can have comical results, such as the other day when I accidentally walked into a low-hanging tree branch not once, but twice the same branch because I was so focused on my mobile phone. It can be also quite dangerous. I miss the need of others or even creation around me. I can even become quite judgmental or annoyed at others, for example, while waiting in line at the grocery store because some person is taking too much time at the register. I think it is precisely this that Jesus is challenging his audience to pay attention to. Those who have gone missing or those marginalized by everyone's busyness. Jesus is precisely forcing us to not only pay attention to the details, but to care for all. And not just ourselves and the people and things we like. If we truly love others and all of God's creation, then we ought to be moved to care for the suffering, the wounded, and the broken, even the smallest things of life. The 19th century Danish philosopher and writer Søren Kierkegaard once pointed to this in a prayer he wrote as a preface to an essay on the changelessness of God. While maintaining the classic Christian understanding of God as all perfect and unchanging, Kierkegaard wonderfully praises God for his attentiveness to creation, even the most minute detail of creation. Unlike humans, God's infinite, infinite love moves God to respond to the needs of ever 
of needs of all of us, he writes. But everything moves you, and in infinite love. Even what we human beings call a trifle, and unmoved pass by, the sparrow's needs moves you. What we all so often scarcely pay attention to, a human sigh, that moves you, infinite love. Taking heed of the people and world around us, we become more attentive to the cry of those lost, wounded, and forsaken. We hear the groaning of creation as it suffers under the weight of humanity's misuse and abuse. As Gerald Manley Hopkins says so eloquently in his poem, God's Grandeur, generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shared man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. What shall our shall response be? Upon hearing the cries and groans of all creation, we are, are we moved to act? Are we willing to leave the 99 to search for the one lost? Are we willing to let go of all that comf comforts and protects us and venture out and attend to the need of others? In reality, we have no choice but to respond to the needs of this world and God's people. Despite our modern and Western con conception that we are but individuals living and actively acting independently of each other in creation, our existence and life is dependent upon the well-being of the world around us. This is what the prophet Jeremiah and all the other prophets of the Old Testament are attentive to. If we ignore the cries of the poor, if we fail to notice the desolation of creation, then we shall suffer the wrath of our ignorance and silence. Challenging words to hear, but true. Our hunger for more earthly treasures and desire to tame and shape the world into our fashion has already resulted in dire consequences, natural disasters on a scale we've never seen before. Even though we may think of ourselves as independent and free, deep down I believe we long to be one, not only with each other, but also with creation and with God. In our independence, we found isolation and have become strangers unto ourselves and the world around us. And so, in the silent darkness of the night, our hearts yearn to belong. Teilhard de Chardin, a French Catholic priest, scientist and paleontologist sensed our need for unity. As well as a great scientist, Deschardins was a mystic and deeply spiritual man. His profoundly moving and deeply spiritual work, Mass for the Life of the World, he points to this desire and our unity, our yearning for unity, not only with each other, but also with creation and God. His prayer is fitting for today, and so I'll close here by reading just a short excerpt from it. Once upon a time, humanity took into your temple the first fruits of their harvest, the flower of their flocks. But the offering you really want the offering you mysteriously need every day to appease your hunger, to slake your thirst, is nothing less than the growth of the world born ever onwards in the stream of universal becoming. Rejoice, O Lord, this all-embracing host which your whole creation, moved by your magnetism, offers you at this dawn of a new day. 
This bread, our toil, is of itself, I know, but an immense fragmentation. This wine, our pain, is no more. I know than a drought that dissolves. Yet in the very depths of this formless mass you have implanted, and thus I'm sure of, for I sense it, a desire, irresistible, hallowing, which makes us cry out, believer and unbeliever alike, Lord, make us one. Amen.